Good morning. This Remembrance Day is similar to the original Armistice Day, November the 11th, 1918. Canadian Army Surgeon John McRae noted the ironies of warfare in his poem, In Flanders Fields. Nothing, nothing could grow between the trenches. The land was churned up by tanks, by grenades, pockmarked by craters from shells, and was strewn with the debris of war. The land was desecrated, bereft of life, except except for the poppies. Those hardy and flamboyant plants that defy desolation and to McRae, they personified hope. And birds defied madness, madness of war as well. He wrote the larks, still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. Then and now, the days are similar. Peace has replaced bombardment. Rebuilding has overtaken destruction, and prayers for delivery have been replaced by prayers of thanksgiving. But rampant deaths followed the 1918 armistice, casting a dark shadow across the world. The Spanish flu killed more people than all the military and civilian losses combined from 1914 to 1918. Having won the victory over an armed aggressor, we could not deal with the invisible flow, a microbe that could be neither treated nor eradicated. A century later, a similar pestilence has returned. The name is new and different, COVID-19, but the battleground is the same. COVID-19 started by attacking the aged, the infirm, and the weakened, and then it came back to attack the young and the hardy again and again. Like the soldiers of old, we resorted to entrenchment, closing schools, shutting, school, shutting church doors, sealing the borders, international, provincial, and even municipal. We accepted self-isolation, cutting ourselves off from friends and from family. In order to protect our neighbors, we now wear masks whenever we go out. We stand just two meters apart when we meet, and when we're passing, we do so quickly, keeping as much distance as possible. Dining out is impossible. We avoid enclosed spaces and opt for coffee at a park bench instead, socially separated, of course. And for the first time in my memory, we will not gather at the cenotaphs across Canada on November the 11th. Unthinkable, unthinkable. But the imperative is still there. The charge is to remember. It isn't don't forget, but the imperative remember. I like the way the French translation makes the obligation personal. Je me souviens. I myself shall remember. The first French concentration camp was established in Bavaria in 1933, six, six years before the war began. Dachau exists today as a reminder. I recall pausing at the plaque by the front gate. Those who do not remember the mistakes of the past are condemned to repeat them, it says. Not will, not might, but they are condemned to repeat them. So we do remember. We remember for them. We remember for ourselves. We remember for our children. We have aged in memory. A crutch won at Normandy. A wheelchair earned in Sicily. An uncle, now taciturn, who everyone said was the life of the party until he came back from the war. Aged parents' wistful glance at the family table and a chair now vacant since their son went to Kosovo. Perhaps a row of medals or a cross for valor mounted or displayed, and a family picture with one or two people in uniform. Sadly, we are deprived of memories that can never happen. A branch of the family tree cut off prematurely. A line ended as that branch was prevented from bearing fruit. A future without aunts, uncles, cousins, and all the joy they could have brought us. Consider the names. Leeside and Etobicoke have memorial pools. I wonder whether our children, or young adults for that matter, reflect on the word memorial. Memorial for what? To whom? Memorial parks exist in Mimico, Port Credit, and Meaford. Memorial drives in North York, Branford, and Orillia. Have the names become transitory honors? Can memory be perpetuated without reminders? 
Sadly, we have recurring reminders. Canada has 2,000 men and women currently serving in 200 missions, keeping the peace. Some monitoring those fragile lulls in warfare, and others remaining to train local people on how to preserve peace once it has been achieved. A new concept to many of them. Our Navy is suppressing piracy in the Persian Gulf. From Afghanistan to Ukraine, these troops are representing us. Some return with wounds, others never return. Some serve at home, fighting floods, wildfires, and COVID-19, which started killing seniors in long-term care homes. All face physical harm or death. They deserve to be honored. They deserve to be remembered. Canadian forces and our police officers, they are very much alike, a reflection of the society from which they come. Both give us protection from people lacking a respect for orderly society. They are barely visible in normal times, but they are vitally essential when we are threatened. We see them in uniform on Remembrance Day. So in our prayers, let us give thanks for those in the 1914 conflict who taught us that peace had to be earned, and they answered the call. And to those from 1939 to 1945 who established that peace has to be maintained and the price of neglecting it. And for our troops who served in Korea, Palestine, the Balkans, and other places where they upheld that might is not right. Some defended that principle with their lives. In those prayers, give thanks to the forces currently serving in the regular forces and in the reserves. Their presence and their readiness mean that we may never again have to turn the other cheek. Never again. Blessed are the children of God for they should be called peacemakers. Je me souviens. Amen.